An overview of capillary electrophoresis presented by the National Forensic Science Technology Center. Electrophoresis is the movement of charged particles or fragments through a medium. Cations migrate towards the negatively charged electrode called the cathode, and anions are attracted towards the positively charged electrode called the anode. Electrophoresis is affected by size, shape or conformation of the fragment, pH, matrix of the medium, and the temperature. Operation of a capillary electrophoresis system involves application of a high voltage, typically 10 to 30 kilovolts, across a narrow bore 25 to 100 micrometer capillary. The capillary is filled with a viscous polymer solution which serves as a sieving medium. The ends of the capillary are dipped into reservoirs filled with electrolyte. Electrodes made of an inert material such as platinum are also inserted into the electrolyte reservoirs to complete the electrical circuit. A small volume of sample is injected into one end of the capillary. The capillary passes through a detector, usually a UV absorbance detector at the opposite end of the capillary. Application of a voltage causes movement of the sample ions towards their appropriate electrode, usually passing through the detector. The plot of detector response with time is generated, which is termed an electropherogram. The capillaries used are normally fused silica capillaries covered with an external polyamide protective coating to give them increased mechanical strength. Bare fused silica is extremely fragile. A small portion of this coating is removed to form a window for detection purposes. The window is aligned in the optical center of the detector. The inner surface of the capillary can be chemically modified by covalently binding coatings of different kind of substances onto the capillary wall. These coatings are used for a variety of purposes, such as to reduce sample adsorption or to change the ionic charge on the capillary wall. The forensic capillaries typically used in CE from ABI are 47 centimeters by 50 micrometers uncoated, 36 centimeters from the cathode to the detector. They contain performance-optimized 4% polymer, POP4, which is composed of 4% DMA homopolymer, 8 molar urea, 5% 2-pyrrolidinone, 100 millimolar N-tris hydroxymethyl methyl 3 aminopropane sulfonic acid taps at a pH of 8.0. The DNA separation mechanism. It is a size-based separation due to the interaction of DNA molecules with entangled polymer strands. The polymers are not cross-linked as in slab gels, and the gel is not attached to the capillary wall. The gel is pumpable, which means it can be replaced after each run, and the polymer length and concentration determine the separation characteristics. Here we have a buildup of the entangled polymer strands. When the DNA molecules are introduced, they flow from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. As they do so, the smaller DNA molecules are able to pass through the entangled polymer strands first. This allows for a size-based separation. This slide shows the basic setup of a capillary electrophoresis system in an instrument. First, there's the capillary, which is approximately 50 micrometers in diameter and about 47 centimeters in length. You have a burn capillary window for detection, an organ ion laser for excitation, and then you have the inlet, which is the cathode, and the outlet, which is the anode. A charge of 15 kilovolts is applied and the capillary is filled with a polymer solution. The DNA separation occurs in approximately 30 minutes. How capillary electrophoresis works. Samples are amplified and denatured. There is an electrokinetic injection which gets a sample into the capillary. Electrophoresis occurs which is a size-based separation of the DNA. Then there is detection by excitation of dyes and collection of emission wavelengths, and then finally, software analysis.
There are multiple instrumentation options for different sample throughput. Here we have the 310 which has one capillary, the 3100 Advant which has four capillaries, and the 3100 which has 16 capillaries. Here is a depiction of the inside of the ABI PRISM 310 genetic analyzer. On the auto sampler is where the samples are placed. You have the capillary which is run from the cathode to the anode, the heat plate which keeps a constant temperature, the syringe pump which pumps the capillaries full of polymer, and the detection window where the emission from the excitation by the laser is collected. For an electrokinetic injection, a voltage is applied to the sample and any charged particles will migrate into the capillary. The capillary and electrode are placed into the sample solution vial and a voltage is applied. If the sample is ionized and the appropriate voltage polarity is used, then sample ions will migrate into the capillary. This type of injection is known as an electrokinetic sampling. The electrokinetic injection process. The amount of salt in the sample affects how much DNA migrates into the capillary. The amount of DNA is inversely proportional to the ionic strength. For proper separation of the DNA, the following things are important. Run temperature. 60 degrees Celsius helps reduce the secondary structure in the DNA and improves precision. Electrophoresis buffer. Urea in the running buffer helps to keep the DNA strands denatured. Capillary wall coating. The dynamic coating is with the polymer, and the polymer solution POP4 acts as a sieving medium to perform the size-based separation of the DNA. DNA molecules possess a constant mass-to-charge ratio. Therefore, regardless of the size of the DNA molecule, they will have the same force pulling on it when an electrical field is applied. A sieving medium can then be used that will retard the bigger molecules and allow the smaller molecules to move faster, and this allows for a size-based separation. Fluorescent labeling of PCR products. Dyes are attached to one primer in a pair and are used to amplify STR marker. Dyes are coupled to oligonucleotide primers through NHS esters and amine linkages on the 5' end of the primer, usually through a 6-carbon spacer. Dye-labeled oligonucleotide is incorporated into PCR product during multiplex PCR amplification, giving a specific color tag to each PCR product. Dyes can be spectrally distinguished using virtual filters and CCD imaging to yield different colored peaks in ABI 310 electrophorogram. The laser used in the ABI 310. It is an argon ion laser and has wavelengths between 488 nanometers and 514.5 nanometers for excitation of dyes. It has had 10 milliwatt power and has a lifetime of approximately 5,000 hours, which is one year of full-time use. The cost to replace is about $5,500. It leads to the highest degree of variability between instruments and is the most replaced part. Color separation matrix is specific to the laser used on the instrument. This animation shows the detection of separated samples. First, there is size-based separation of the dye-labeled PCR products. Then, excitation of the dyes by the argon ion laser. This is followed by emission of the fluorescence, which is detected on a CCD camera, which sorts the dyes based on their wavelength. The CCD camera, which stands for Charge Couple Device, has virtual filters, which separates the different emissions of fluorescence from the dyes based on their wavelengths. For detection, there is hardware which is a CCD camera and software which is a color matrix. Filters determine which wavelengths of light are collected onto the CCD camera. Detection methods. With fluorescence, you label one of the primers for each locus. Fluorescence results when a fluorescent dye known as a fluorophore absorbs incident light, this is the excitation process, and in response emits light emission at a different wavelength. During excitation, a photon from a laser source excites the fluorophore electron to an excited state. The electron then undergoes a conformational change 
and the excited electron emits a photon at a lower energy as it returns to the ground state. Because energy and wavelength are inversely proportional to each other, the emission photon has a higher wavelength than the excitation photon. The difference in wavelength between the fluorescence excitation maximum and the fluorescence emission maximum is called the Stokes shift. The Stokes shift allows the use of optical filters to separate excitation light from emission light. The Stokes shift is the difference between the excitation wavelength and the emission wavelength. This table shows the maximum emission and excitation wavelengths of some of the commonly used dyes in capillary electrophoresis. Here is a depiction of the fluorescent emission spectra for the ABI dyes. You have the laser excitation occurring between 488 to 514.5 nanometers and then you have the different wavelengths at which these dyes are detected. This is dye set G5. Instead of four dyes, there are five dyes. This is used in the ABI identifier kits. Fluorescence measurements. Spectral overlap occurs because there are regions between different dyes that share the same wavelength. Multi-component analysis is performed with a mathematical matrix that subtracts out the contributions of other dyes in each measured fluorescent dye. One method to perform multi-component analysis is to examine a standard set of DNA fragments labeled with each dye. This is known as matrix standard samples. The computer software analyzes the data from each of the dyes and creates a matrix file to reflect the color overlap between the various dyes. Here is an example of what a 4-die matrix table and a 5-die matrix table will look like. Troubleshooting capillary electrophoresis. You can have off-scale data, migration problems, laser problems, buffer depletion, capillary failure, low or no current, or spikes in the baseline. Off-scale data. If too much sample DNA is added to the PCR reaction mixtures, the fluorescence intensity from the PCR products may exceed the linear dynamic range for detection by the instrument. This is referred to as off-scale data. Multi-component analysis cannot be formed accurately on data that is off-scale. Samples with off-scale peaks will exhibit raised baselines and or excessive pull-up of one or more colors under the off-scale peaks. Analyzed data from off-scale peaks should not be used for quantitative comparisons. For example, the stutter peak that corresponds to an off-scale main peak is likely to be overestimated. Here is an example of pull-up. Here we have a small peak in green that is being pulled up into the larger peak in blue. And this is due to signal and spectral overlap. Migration problems. Migration problems can be visualized when samples on the same run in different injections migrate at a different rate from each other. This is best seen when the ladder migrates differently from the samples. The ladder is used to assign allele calls to the samples. If the samples on the ladder are not sized within the same range, then the sample's peaks will not have the correct allele calls. One cause of migration problems is fluctuations in temperature during a run. The instruments are equipped with a hot plate or oven to keep the temperature constant during the electrophoresis process. However, there are regions of the capillary that are not in contact with the heat source. If there are variations in the room temperature during the course of a run, samples will migrate at different rates. High temperatures will cause samples to migrate faster and colder temperatures will cause samples to migrate slower. Here we have a depiction of the same sample run in the same run but at different times. As you can see from the three peaks, the last three samples have migrated at a different rate than the previous samples. The laser used in the genetic analyzers is an argon ion laser. Over time, a condition known as outgassing can occur. Outgassing is the slow release of gas from the laser tube. This results in a loss of laser power. As the laser power reduces, so does the resulting signal produced by the DNA molecules. 
The result is low peak heights which will continue to get lower over time. Buffer depletion. If there is a drop off in the current, this can be caused by buffer depletion. During electrophoresis, ions move through the capillary. Positive ions move to the negatively charged electrode and negative ions to the positively charged electrode. This ion movement results in an imbalance referred to as buffer depletion. To avoid this from happening, the buffer should be changed regularly. Capillary failure. Abnormally broad peaks due to loss of resolution can be caused by capillary failure. Capillary failure occurs as a result of DNA and enzymes from the injected samples adhering to the capillary wall. To prevent this, Applied Biosystems does not recommend using a capillary past 100 injections. However, many laboratories have validated capillaries for use well past 100 injections. A good way to check to see if the problem is due to capillary failure or a bad sample will be to look at the size standard peaks. If the size standard peaks are as they should be, but the sample peaks are low or appear to have lost resolution, then there may be a problem with the way the sample was set up. Also, if both the size standard and sample peaks are bad in one injection, but there are no problems in other injections, that one sample may have been injected badly. Low or no current. There are several problems which can cause low or no current. A common problem is if the capillary ends are not stored in water or buffer when the instrument is not in use. If the ends of the capillary dry out, then urea or other salts from the buffer will form crystals at the capillary ends. These crystals can partially or fully clog the capillary ends, resulting in low or no current. This will be seen as consistent low-level data. Low or no current can also be caused by bubbles in the pump block. These air bubbles block the flow of current from one electrode to the next. The pump block should always be checked to ensure no bubbles are present in the pump block or in the base of the syringe since an air bubble there may be injected into the pump block. Depicted in this diagram are several areas where bubbles can be formed in the pump block. Bubbles in the channels can prevent flow of ions and are usually exhibited by zero current when the voltage is applied. Dye blobs. Free dyes not coupled to a primer can be injected into the capillary electrophoresis capillary and interfere with the detection of true SDR alleles. Dye blobs are wider and usually of less intensity than true SDR alleles. The amount depends on the purity of the primers used. Dye blobs usually appear at an apparent size that is unique for each dye. This electrophorogram shows an example of a dye blob, which is shorter than the main peaks and also wider. Spikes in the baseline appear as peaks, but they usually have a sharp point and are in all dye colors. They can be caused by fluctuations in the current, precipitates in the polymer, or old polymer. Here is an example of spikes in the baseline. They tend to have sharp points and are present in all of the colors. The operator manuals for the capillary electrophoresis instruments have an extensive section on troubleshooting bad data due to problems with the instrument. Here is an example of what an ABI PRISM 3100 genetic analyzer looks like. Similarly to the 310, the 3100 Avant has an auto sampler for the samples. Instead of one capillary, it now has a capillary array and it has an oven which gives better temperature stability. Also, it is able to deliver more polymer with two syringes instead of one. This is an example of what a four capillary array looks like. The 3100 Avant system is a four capillary instrument with an upgrade option to 16 capillaries without taking additional bench space. The Avant system is based on 3100 technology. The original 3100 system was for a 16 capillary instrument. The 3100 has dual side illumination, it has a temperature range from 18 to 65 degrees Celsius, and the order sampler supports 96 and 384 trays, two trays per setup, and it can be left to run up to 24 hours with unattended operation.